All right. Um, <clears throat> we're still in the book of 1 John. Um, today, we're going to pick up in uh, 1 John chapter 4. Um, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12. Um, just want to briefly recap. Uh, last week, um, we looked at John, uh, 1 John uh, 4, 1 through 4. And just this morning, as even I was kind of going back over that and just kind of thinking through um, just this idea that we looked at last week of, of testing the spirits and uh, the things that you hear, are they from God or from uh, from the Antichrist? Or are they, do they line up with who God is or uh, do they not? Um, just the, the idea, um, and I just was kind of really reminded about uh, last week and I just wanted to restate it this week um, because I, I, I don't want to... Uh, anyone to miss this, and that's the, the fact that um, God's never going to contradict His Word. Um, and um, I just don't feel like that can be said enough, is that God's never going to contradict and go against what He said in His Word. And a secondary thing is that uh, last week we looked at the idea of, uh, I think it was verse uh, 5, uh, they are from the world, these false prophets that we looked at. Uh, therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And last week we talked about and kind of hit on the idea of, of the message that these false prophets are speaking, uh, that the world is drawn to it. Um, and I made the comment uh, that uh, for me that I want to be real careful that the things that I'm hearing, um, that it's not the things of the world, that I'm not, I'm not falling into what this other teaching is. Um, and so I just really wanted to... I, I would encourage you, if you mark in your Bible, I, I would really encourage you to, to, to underline that and make the note in there to be careful um, the messages that you hear. And that's not just, from, I'm not talking about from the church, I'm talking about uh, from your friends, from coworkers, from uh, TV shows. We get a lot of things that are contrary to the gospel, and a lot of times we're listening to those things. Um, so to me, that's an incredible verse. It's a reminder to be real careful uh, about the things that we do here and we listen to. So... I just want to share that. That's kind of that's extra, um, but in like I said, in reading it this morning and, and just really chewing on it, um, I just feel like I need to say that. So, anyway, First John chapter four, uh, verses seven through twelve is the focus for today, and it reads, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And if everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, excuse me, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God." The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another... God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. So some really um, great verses, and we're going to do kind of what we do um, every week. I want, to, I want to kind of walk through these. And today, really, um, I really feel like these verses, uh, in a sense, are uh, simple. Um, it's, I feel like we're going to be able to walk through these uh, fairly easily, um, and they're and they're real straightforward. I guess simple's not a, the best word. They're more they're more uh, straightforward. Um, so, so that being said, I just want to I just want to kind of jump in on verse seven um, and start just walking through. Um, similar to like I say every week, if you are at home doing Bible study and you're walking through verses, the questions you would ask yourself: What are things that stand out? Um, so, beginning in verse seven, it says, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God." And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So what are some things that we see there, and what are some things that stand out? It uses the word beloved again. <laughs> 100%. I and mean, you don't want to miss that. I mean, it is a word that we've been seeing a lot lately. Um, as we're just kind of chewing on this, but it's not a term that he uses every single verse or every single sentence, and, and it's a term of endearment. He has a, a pastorly concern, a fatherly concern, um, and so what he's fixing to say, it means a lot to him, and he doesn't want 
uh, us to miss it or the church to miss it is that are reading it. So it's when you see that 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 phrase, beloved, you, you want to key in. So what he's what he's fixing to say means something. So I want to pay attention to what he's talking about. Um, so that's that's great. That's perfect that you mentioned that. Um, what are some other things? I noticed when I was studying this this week, and and the word beloved, and we don't use it anymore. Mm-hmm. And if we're 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 witnessing to someone, I mean it. It would behoove us not to use that because we're letting them know that we love them. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thought. Something I noticed out of just the the whole epistle, the first chapter, he doesn't use that term, beloved little children, or anything like that. It's like the first chapter, he's like directed that, pointed that right to the Gnostics that he's talking to. <coughs> but then when he gets to chapter 2, it starts out with my little children. Mm-hmm. So now he's switching. like he's, he's, he's telling these people that this is what you don't believe anymore because this is what you should believe. And then he, he suddenly goes right into the, to the believers and, and starts talking to them. That's good. That's really good. And you take it a little bit further too. Like for, for, for me, like I see um, the statements that he makes in chapter 1 are all very pointed and very direct. Um, and when he starts to transition in, uh, to later in his letter, it's all application based on the factual things that he says in chapter 1. And so as he cra- calls out and he says, beloved or little children, he's, he's saying it in light of the reality of who God is, the relationship we're supposed to have with God, living the life that he's called us to live because of the things that he states in chapter 1. Um, so, I mean, it's really, that's a really good point. So. <laughs> but, but does it say does it say dear dear, dear ones or no? Dear and it says dear friends, but okay. it's yeah. <laughs> but it does in seven. It says the word love three times, uh-huh. and sometimes I get a little confused. I think I don't want to say it's overused. The word, the looseness of it, mm-hmm. but it all all I can think too is, and the greatest of these is love. Mm-hmm. Of all everything God says. And it's like three times, three times, right? Yeah, and and something that's really good there is that uh, you just along your thought of uh, love being a a word that's really been cheapened um, is something that John hits home is like that if to to love is to have it in action. Um, We cheapen it because we say love. Oh, we say I love that chair. Man, I love that that chair. That I love that chair. Uh, You know, but but uh, I mean, for me, I'll be honest. Uh, a word that I try not to use that word that, that often is the word awesome. Um, if somebody says awesome, uh, you know, oh, it's awesome. Um, I, I, I really try not to use that word because I feel like only God is truly awesome. And I don't want to take that away by saying, and it's the same type of idea. I don't want to reply to somebody and say, oh, hey, I got that job. Awesome. I try and say, man, that's, all, that's, that's, a, that's great. Uh, that's wonderful, you know, or something along those lines. Because I want to, I want to reserve the word "awesome" uh, for what, when I'm relating it to something that God's doing or something I about awesome. God. I use so. awesome a lot, but I, it, but the word "love" comes to me, and I want to because there's so many words we can use yeah. in place of that to even mm-hmm. give that chair just as much, you know, emphasis by instead of using the word "love." love. Yeah. Well, Danny, in the best case, only God is good, so you can't say things. That's good that's true. That's true. Or that's a good. Nothing happens without God. So you saying awesome, somebody got a job that's glorifying. Yeah. So yeah, those are good thoughts. Those are good thoughts. Um, but but that is the back to the idea of love, though. I mean, it is really good because we we do really cheapen it. Um, what are some other things that come to mind, especially if you've been here uh, for the last you know couple months? What are some things that that come to mind when you read when we read this topic on love? So, something that should stand out to you is that this isn't the first time that we've seen the idea of love, right? Have we have we read about loving your brother before? Yeah, like a lot. Like it feels like a lot. I don't know. Maybe it is because it comes up a lot, or maybe I say it a lot. Um, but we've we've talked about several times in here um, as we've processed through verses where John talks about. Um, what it looks like to love. Look at John, First uh, John three uh, thirteen through fifteen. Just like turn the page or scroll back just a little bit. First John three thirteen through fifteen. It says, "Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of life into death because we love the brethren. 
He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The idea of love. And we spent a lot of time diving into what that looked like. Look at 1 John 2, uh, verses 10 and 11. Turn back one more page. 1 John 2, 10 and 11. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Um, again, we spend a lot of time uh, diving into that and talking about it. Um, so as John writes, as I've, I've said here before, you can, you can probably miss next week um, and, and you'll probably be able to figure out what we're talking about. Um, because John, he does, can, he does uh, bring about the same ideas over and over because he's trying to, to uh, communicate ideas um, that are that are heavy um, to him and that are important and that mean a lot. Um, so, um, t- for him, the the focus of something that's going on with these Gnostics, who he was uh, writing, you know, to this church and this this idea of Gnosticism, and these Gnostics are coming in saying that there's another way to be able to have a relationship with God that has nothing to do with Christ Jesus, has to do with knowledge and live the type of life that you want. Um, there was a, a major lacking in love. And so for John, uh, something that he's trying to communicate is like, look, if you have accepted the gospel and you have the gospel in your life, it will be displayed in love. 14? I think. I don't know. I might have missed that up. You just have to hear it over and over and over. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, so, so, and that's exactly right. It's not by chance that John is continuing to bring these ideas back around. Um, so, uh, um, so, why is there such an emphasis on love? Because God is love. Yeah. Next verse says it. Yeah. Hundred percent. Love is not God, but God is love. Yeah. And that's what the footnote somewhere in here says. Oh. They hope in love, and the greatest of these is love. That's good. That's always. good. Actually, all, all of these verses that we're looking at have to do with the idea of why uh, love is so important. Um, verses 7 and 8 uh, focus on the fact that love is God's nature. Um, love is from God, it says in verse 7, and God is love in verse 8. That's what Sandra was just Sandra and Doug were just saying. Um, so one of the main reasons that uh, love is such an emphasis is because that's, that's who God is. Um, verses 9 and 10 uh, focus on the fact that God's gift uh, it comes in the form of Christ Jesus um, in that we've been loved and forgiven. How can a person that understands uh, that our forgiveness and, uh, understands our forgiveness and the sacrifice of Christ and the expression of love that was given to us not also uh, be able to go in love? You know, Christ was given to us and we were forgiven. We um, have, have been forgiven. Uh, redeemed because of this love so how can we not go and love and you know it's like it's a reciprocation um because this has been given to me how can i not also willingly want to go in love and the third thing verses 11 and 12 um talk about uh god's present activity uh, among his people um as we go and live the type of life that we're supposed to live it manifests God's love in the world. So it's important that we go love because that's who God is. Because we've been forgiven and as forgiven people, we should go in love. But then also as we go in love, it manifests God's love in the world. It's, it says in, in the verse 12 that it's perfected. God's, God's love is perfected in us. So it's this picture of like because we have the gospel, this is what life is supposed to look like. This is what it, this is the this is the reality of what it all entails. So I want to walk through these verses, just kind of break down them. Uh, it says, "Love is from God." In verse seven, it says, "Love is from God." What does that mean? Okay, you're allowed to. Um, it's and I love it. What it says. Um, God's love always involves a choice and an action. And our love should be like this. And then it has the questions, my favorite thing that it asks in this study part. How well do you display your love for God (coughs) in the choices you make and the actions you take? So it's always a choice. 
Amen. That's good. Which goes back to other parts of the letter, too, where he wants us to make choices of righteousness, to be able to choose to do things. So, I mean, that's, that's real good. That's some good thought. Um, when it says love is from God, what does that mean? It's a gift from God. Okay. In, in the form of Christ Jesus. Yes. Who, who ultimately came and, and ultimately sacrificed his life. I mean, you, you do you think you chew on this for a second. Uh, God could have sent Christ Jesus to the earth as a prophet. And that's it. He could have sent Christ Jesus as just a person who walked the earth and said, I'm the son of God, follow my example, and this is how you're going to be righteous. He could have done that. But he gave the ultimate love by, by sending Christ Jesus and having a way for us to have ultimate uh, propitiation, as it's going to talk about, as ultimate sacrifice and acceptable sacrifice for us. Love is from God. That's what, you know, what I want you guys to do is we're, we're, we're going to break this down a phrase, phrase or verse at a time. I just want you to chew on like if you're at home and you read "Love is from God," what is, you know? What is that going to? What's that saying to you? What's it? What's it? What are we supposed to pull from that? We the John says that because he wants us to chew on the fact and the idea that he sent Christ Jesus and sent him to fully give his life so that we could be made right with God. John says God is love, not love is. That she was yeah. saying so, a second ago. Not love is God. Well, no, I see God. God I is, know. The God first is part love. Of it, why are they not? But, but the opposite, see, God is all love. But if you said love is God, then that's saying love is greater than God. God. Okay, God. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, the, the, the next part of that verse, the last part, says, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. What's that talking about? You know what I kind of get from this is if I want to really love, <clears throat> if I want to really love something, then I can't do it without God because He is love. And through Him, I know what love is. Amen. I mean, I feel sorry for those people who don't have God and say they're in love and they're not. And they don't really know what love is. Amen. Amen. It's like a fireproof. Caleb, you know, said he loved his wife, but at the end, when he got saved, he said, "How can I love something if I don't know what love is?" I don't know. That's good. It's good tying that in. That's really good. <clears throat> and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Um, I wrote down, "Everyone who loves is born of God, and knows God," because we've been given a new nature, and the new nature is displayed through us. You can't be born of God and not live it. It's impossible. <coughs> Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Everyone who, who truly loves is born of God and knows God. Because everyone that, that loves, has, and you have this relationship with Christ, you've been given a new nature. A new nature re resides in you. And it causes you to go out and love and if you don't go out in love, then there's a major contradiction between what you confess with your mouth and the life that you're choosing to live. So what about people in the world who are extremely, I mean, I would even think to use the word loving, good, good, morally people, but they're, they're not believers. How are they that? I mean... I think that uh, personally, I think that because God is love, and that's His uh, uh, an attribute of who He is, and and humans are created in His image, that we all have in us this desire to, um, at times, want to love. Um, but I think it comes, it goes back to um, the heart. You know, a person might uh, be moved to want to. Uh, go do some great uh, philanthropic, you know, 
work or to be able to do this. But the reality of where they're at and their heart really is, you know, you can do great and do this big, great thing here um, while these other areas of your life are greatly lacking um, and greatly missing the Lord. Um, so I, I think it's just like, you know, we all uh, have in us the, the built-in, uh, you know, idea of right from wrong. Um, I think it also comes back to your motivation. You know? And even as Christians, sometimes our motives can be question in question. Based, I mean, even though we are loving toward other people and stuff, sometimes it goes back to what yeah. our motives are. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my grandfather, before he passed away, he was probably the most moral person that I ever knew in my entire life. He's, he was more moral than anybody I ever went to church with. I never heard him say a cuss word. I never heard him, I never saw him get angry, never heard about him getting angry. Uh, he's a great guy, um, you know, truly great guy. Uh, but as he got closer to uh, the end of his life, he, he ended up getting Lou Gehrig's disease and, uh, you know, just started getting real uh, degenerative in his muscles and, you know, I remember going over there and talking to him one day about the Lord and uh, almost kind of getting into an argument with him because uh, he was uh, very intellectual. Uh, he was an engineer um, by, by trade. And so for him, he had to be able to make logical sense of Christ Jesus coming. And so we're sitting there, you know, just kind of getting into it. Um, but uh, for him, like he, uh, just the way that he was created was that uh, the Lord created him to to be the type of man that um, honor and respect and these things, that's what meant things to, that's what meant to him. Um, and so that's the code that he lived his life by. Um, you know, but, and luckily before he did pass away, he did come to know who Christ Jesus was um, in an incredible, miraculous story. Um, but, you know, I, the only thing, I mean, and I, I chewed on that this morning too, you know, the only thing I could think of is that, um, you know, it's possible to love without God but I don't think it's possible to truly love without God. And I mean, it is the, the it does go back to the motivation of your heart. Um, and it's it's you, anybody can go do some great thing. I can be sacrificial to my wife. I can you know I can do whatever th- this thing is. Um, but it's the idea of like for me, I, I reconcile it in my mind the idea of uh, trying to go and be <coughs> sacrificial to my wife, um, which I'm able to do. But trying eventually makes you tired. Um, and so for these people, you I mean you can go do great things and you can go do some loving thing, uh, but it's not something you can sustain. I don't believe long term, or not, you know, or maybe you can do some great thing in the public eye, but the reality is in the closet at home with this and this. Um, there's there's going to be a disconnect somewhere along the line. So we were talking about this. We were we were watching a movie on pure clips last night, which now that's all we watch is pure clips, maybe. But oh. Uh, there was a, a girl in there, and, and one of the girls was, was sharing Christ with her, and it's like totally, she was a totally different person than what they knew. And she, this other girl got aggravated. She goes, I'm nice. I, I, I'm nice to other people. I do things for the community. I do this, that, and everything. And I, I told him, I said, it, I, is that going to be like, you know, if she doesn't accept Christ, one day you're going to stand before God and say, but God, I did this, 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 and this. Are you going to be that person who he says, you know, I never knew you? Yeah. You know, okay, um, the truth is, is like there's, in our heads, in my head anyway, and even, um, or uh, doubts, and I get, I'll get upset, like if I'm starting to doubt something and or I don't understand the word. I just don't, I can't get my head around something. I usually am able to come back and have a great relief because it's okay if I don't understand it because I know he's in my heart. Mm-hmm. That is the bottom line. 100%. Because I don't understand everything. Mm-hmm. And i got lots of questions. Well, not a lot, but several for sure mm-hmm. when I get to heaven. So, um, and that's it. Because a lot, you were saying, you know, analytical people sometimes... And good moral people, but I am really relieved when I get doubts mm-hmm. that it really the truth, the bottom line is that he's in my heart. Amen. And that is like a big relief. Amen. Because you can really twist yourself mm-hmm. if you're analyzing and mm-hmm. really studying. It can mess, mess you up. I'm not going to lie. I heard a preacher talk one time. He was preaching, and he says, uh, he said, uh, I have never doubted a day in my life. He says oh. it's from the pulpit. And uh, 
and it's a guy that I, I mean, I really respect this guy like a lot. And uh, it just took me back. I was like, well, I mean, in, in like last week, y'all heard me talk about testing. You know, I said, I don't care. I, lo- I really respect this guy, but I'm going to test what I'm hearing. And it don't matter if it's, you know, it didn't matter if it was Rick. It don't matter if it was Royce. It don't matter if it's this other guy that I really respect. Or uh, it don't matter if it's some big name. Uh, I'm going to test. And when I heard him say that, I was like, that might be the case for you, but that's not the case for me. And I know the relationship that I have with the Lord. Uh, there's days here. I mean, I'll be studying in the morning. I just sit there and just start thinking about Jesus dying on the cross and God sent him to the earth. And I'm like, how? You know? And I just like, it, I mean, seriously, it, it, like even from you know me, I sit there and I just like it just blows me away. And I just sit there and think, there's no way. There's no way, it's made for me, there's no way. You know, then I just have to back up and sit there and say, you know what? But I, this is truth, you know? So I sit there, I mean, just to affirm you, like, hey, like, you know, if you sit there and say, I would, you know, that guy says that he's never doubted a day in his life since he gave his life to the Lord. Straight as that quote, exactly what he said. Yeah. I, I say, just hearing that. for me, I would say, though, I have doubted. And I've questioned uh, things with me, but but I know what this says, and, and I'll never not believe what this says. Right. Just because I don't understand. That's one hundred percent, or because like I can't get my mind around it. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this is so big and so grand, like you know. Oh, uh, today Stephen and I were talking. It's like, what if flyers actually had their pants on fire? What if liars really had their pants on fire? Uh, <laughs> what were you going to say? Oh, uh, what y'all were just talking about. That's something, this is exactly something that I needed to hear because I, I deal with this every single day. And I texted him one day. I said, uh, am I going to make it to heaven? Am I good enough? Am I, am I doing the right thing? That's, I think about that all the time. Well, see, the thing is, is that God, God's infinite. God exists on, on, on levels that we, in our finite minds, we cannot get around. You know, he, he does. And, and so, like, that's what you have to sit there and say is, like, you know, God, he works in ways that we don't understand. Uh, he, you know, he has purposes that we can't get our mind around. You know, he, 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 he does things other than... Deuteronomy says there's things that he that, that are secret to him that we will never know. Um, you know, he he's going to choose not to reveal things to us. And then there's things that he's going to reveal to us that you know, when I was 25, I couldn't handle the things that he showed me right now. You know, but he's brought me through things. He's sanctified me. He's making me more into Christ's image. You know, he's going to reveal things that he's supposed to reveal to us at the time he's supposed to reveal to us. You know, and for me, like part of me struggling with sometimes, you know. I might get up to preach on one Sunday and I'll be sitting there being like, oh man, Lord, I don't, I'm just going to share the gospel and this is like, I can't even get my mind around it right now. You know, but it doesn't change the reality of the fact that the gospel's truth. So, anyway, you just got to remember, God's, God's infinite. He's other than. He's, he's omnipotent. Uh, I don't know if it's just me, but loving people that don't like me, I mean, don't love you. We're supposed to love them too. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. hard. But that's fun. Not only that, but pray for them. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But 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 we don't miss though. I mean that's 100. percent We are supposed to love others. But I don't want to take our focus off of what John's talking about, and that's just supposed to be a love of the brethren, a, a love within the church. I mean, there's some major application there. Don't make it bigger than what he. I mean, there are other scriptures that talk about going and loving those in the world. But the focus here is within the church um, for the majority of, of the things that he's choosing to write. Um, I do Don't want to... Don't we struggle uh, to love some of those in the church? Do what's that? Don't we struggle oh. to love some of those in the church? Amen. <laughs> uh, so I, I do want to... Uh, so I do want to, as we walk through some of these verses real quick, I do want to just point out verse 7. Um, I want to I want to just occasionally walk through some of these Greek verbs that are in here because they're they're just wonderful. Um, verse seven: Let us love one another. Uh, the idea of love right there is that it's a present tense. 
um, but it's a subjunctive mood for the verb, which means um, that there's a, there's a chance that some won't do this. Mm-hmm. Even though this is what's said to be done, some won't go and do it. Um, for love... Um, uh, for love is from God, and that's like a statement of fact. And everyone who who loves is born uh, of God, and that's a a, a past a past tense um, that still has implications for today. Um, everyone who loves is born of God. Something happened in our lives. Uh, I mean, this is what when he says this is what's incredible about the tense that's here is like saying that something happened in our lives where we became born again, and when this happened, it, it's it still has ramifications for us today. Because we're going out and we're loving. That's incredible. Because of the relationship that we have with Christ Jesus, something that happened to us, it has implications for us today. And uh, everyone who is who loves is born of God and knows God present, statement of fact. So anyway, just some neat little nuggets there. Uh, verse 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Um, anything stand out to you guys there? And God's feeling, and this was, came to light I'm, several years ago, sometime in church, but love is usually based on feelings. And if we base every time we are called to love someone on our feelings just like we just said there are people in the church that we're not going to love but if we base it on the feelings oh that person they do this or they did that or I heard they said this about me or whatever but if we base our feelings on it no none of us would come to church because mm-hmm. our, our feelings would always be hurt mm-hmm. we don't we, we shouldn't base our the reason we want to come to church on our feelings but the, the fact that we want to honor and praise God Amen. And worship him. Amen. Amen. That's hundred percent. Well, it says he that loveth not, if you don't know love, the true love from God. If you don't know God, you don't know the true love. Then how can you love? Amen. You might think you love, but it's not the love that's true love. Amen. Is it from your heart or your head? Yeah. People that, that that don't believe in God, that don't trust in God, that says he didn't send his son to the earth to die for us or anything like that. You know, they don't know love. But those of us that know God, that knows that he loved us so much that he did send his only begotten son to live and to die on the earth for us, then that is true love. Amen. Amen. That's good. I think, I think our struggle is the English word. The English word love. Because it's not. There's like seven or eight. Oh, and that's another really good point. Is when it says God is love, it's saying God is agape. Uh, The person that described agape love to me is it's God flavored love. It's God feels love. It's God. When you see agape, you have to see God. Mm -hmm. Truly, and it's it's always wanting and acting for what's best for the person you're loving. Amen. That's really so good. I, I, my kids might, you know, when they were little, would tell me, "Well, I want that cupcake." Oh, sorry, you're not having a cupcake right this second. You're gonna have dinner first. You don't love me. Okay. That, that really is. That's not a great example. But it's, it's, it's always wanting and doing for the other person what is truly in their best interest. You say, "I don't fillet you." <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So that that's struggle with English. Amen. That's good. It's that's really good. Language. Yeah. And, and, and it goes back to what it goes back to what Janice was saying. Like the rest of the world is short. Yeah. And it goes back to kind of what Janice was saying earlier. Is like that we've you know in a sense we've cheap, cheapened the word. Um, because we use it, I love a chair. Uh, you don't love me for a cookie, you, you know. Or, or, or and then at the same time, it's supposed to mean this idea of complete sacrificial, uh, you know, self self giving, a uh, giving of self. You know. It's when we so. um, those people in our lives, or well, it should be any of our brothers and sisters that we know the worst about them, but we believe the best for them. Mm-hmm. I got that from my pastor from Nick, but mm-hmm. I, I, That's really I love good. to share the things that that it just really touch my heart that he shares. Yeah. But yeah, I, he calls them level ten relationships. 
and he says you usually only have three or four. A level 10 relationship for those that are in your life that you know the worst about, but you still believe the best for them. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's real good. Um, verse 9. Um, uh, let me see. <coughs> By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. So what are some things that stick out to us in this verse? Going back to God sending His Son to the earth to die for you. Individually, for you. Mm -hmm. For you, Sheila, individually. For you, individually. For you, individually. If it, if it had just been... For you. each and every person. Amen. That's good. That's good. What what else do we see there? By this love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son in the world so that we might live through him. So so just some I mean just on the surface some simple things that we see here is that uh, the love of God was manifested in us. Um is is the idea of what's there. I know some translations might say among us. Um but the the, the love of God was manifested uh, and even the idea of you could say among us, you just have to be able to process through it deeper um, that the man that it's manifested uh, among us group wise, but the idea is within us, um, and it's, it's this idea this idea that because of the relationship that we have, there's a transformation, a new nature that's happened uh, among us, um, so that we might live through Him is what the verse how the verse continues. So we might live through Him. Because we have this relationship with Christ Jesus, there's other verses we can look at that show that we've been given a new nature. Uh, the book of Ephesians, you look at things that Paul writes. Um, but he, even here in, in 1 John, John's driving home the idea, and he's hitting on the idea that uh, we've been given a new nature. And because we have a new nature, um, we're living through Christ Jesus in us. Um, and so you, you don't, we can't miss that. Um, uh, Let's see. Uh, and then also the idea that's there, um, I wrote down, as I was just kind of just chewing on it, like what we're doing right now, is I wrote down that this is the reality of the gospel life. Um, it's not about a prayer. Uh, this is case in point right here. It's not about a prayer. Um, a prayer isn't, you know, saying a prayer, um, you know, we hear somebody passes away and we say, do they ever say a prayer? Uh, did they, they, you know, not, did they, did they live it in their life? And I'm not trying to, um, you know, <coughs> cause anyone to struggle or I'm not trying to be insensitive. Um, but a lot of times we ask, you know, well, did they say a prayer? Uh, because, because they, that, like, say a person passes away. We know that they never went to church. We know that they never were passionate about Jesus. We know that they never went and did anything for the gospel. We know those things, but we'll say, uh, did they know the Lord? Did they say a prayer? Because we feel like that if we knew that they said a prayer, there's comfort, and well, maybe they're in heaven then. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe they're in heaven. Maybe if they said a prayer, they're in heaven. But John, may, John drives home the point right here that because we have this new nature that we're supposed to be living uh, through Christ Jesus, it's the idea that it's not about a prayer. Uh, for me, I'm just saying this, this is for me, it's not the idea of a prayer. Um, and a lot of times what's been taught in church in years past is come to Jesus, say a prayer, and all right, you said a prayer, now things are good. Um, and it's caused the state of the church in the United States to be where it's uh, filled with people that are nominal, and you have people that are 30, 40, 50 years old who have nothing to do with Jesus um, but who think that they're Christians, um, you know? Uh, we're, we're looking for fruit, aren't we? Yes, and that's what we, we should be. Um, but for a lot of years, there was such a push to, um, to, to get people to say a prayer that the uh, fruit of the gospel was a lot of times left out. Um, and it's really caused the church and the, you know, really the United States, really, I feel, believe, uh, over the last, you know, 10 or 15, 20 years, the fruit of those people just saying prayers and then never really being challenged to live the life has, has really started to, the next generation started to come up and it's starting to, it started to kind of unfold itself. That's how, that's how I believe. Um, 
But something I really see there is that um, the gospel causes people to live a changed life, period. And that's straight. You can't separate that from what the gospel is. Um, all right, well, it's 1048. Um, uh, and, and I just want to throw this in there because we're going to wrap up verse 9. Um, just a really just just food for thought. Um, he sent his only begotten son in the world so that we might live through him. And that's that's a subjunctive. There's a possibility that, that some won't do it. So it's just great. Um, I really I really thought we were gonna get all the way through all that. Uh, but I always feel like that. So um, but it's a great discussion. Um, and just some really good verses. On the idea of love, I don't want to leave you with, uh, with looking on these uh, ideas without. I just, I do want to share the idea. Um, something I wanted to close with, and um, we'll look at it again next week. But I want to tell you, since we've already talked about it so much, is the reality is that anyone who enters into a relationship with Christ Jesus um, can be transformed into a loving person. The application for us today is to ask ourselves, how am I doing at loving others? And we don't want to miss that, guys. We don't want to look at verses on loving others and not examine and look at ourselves. How am I doing at loving other people? Um, how do I, do I give of myself and my time? Do I give my worldly goods? We looked at some other verses previously. Uh, do I have patience with my kids? Am I doing good at loving my wife or my husband? Um, you know, and to really look at those questions. And if the answer is I'm not doing as good as I need to do, I'm going to challenge you to just really dig in and look inwardly and see what needs to change so that you can uh, be loving like you're supposed to. Because it's not by chance, again, that John's sitting here chewing on this idea of loving and loving and loving and loving. It's a big part portion of, of, of what the gospel looks like when we live it out. So if, if you, and who knows what the question is, but for you, if you feel like the Lord's saying, hey, in my life, I don't have this love for this, or I'm not loving like I need to here or, or here, I challenge you just to really dig inwardly and find out what needs to change so that you can Go and love like you're supposed to. And we'll look at that again more next week, but I don't want to look at all that and not uh, throw that out there at you guys. So um, let's close in prayer and we'll get out there for church. So, Father, we just thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for the truth of your word. Uh, we thank you for the heart of the Apostle John. We thank you for uh, his encouragement, his direction, um, Father, where he, when he's telling us uh, to go and love uh, and that this is what love looks like. Um, Father, we just um, we pray in our lives, Father, that we would be. Uh, people that that um, that love, that people see us and they see your love. Uh, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for Christ Jesus. Help us to go in love. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.